Hi, and welcome everybody. I see there are lots of folks that are coming in. I'm so excited that you're joining us. We'll be starting the program in just a moment. Hopefully uh, this is a great opportunity for the sponsors that are joining us to see your names in the marquee lights for just a few moments. Uh, we just wanted to say, and I'll repeat this a couple of times, we welcome all of your questions. Uh, you could put them in the chat or in the Q&A. We're just gonna let the slideshow go once around and then we'll start the program in about one or two more minutes. So welcome everyone. This is Pamela Lavitt from the Seattle Jewish Film Festival. Glad you're joining us this evening for a conversation with filmmaker Becky Tahel. I'm excited that she's joining us and uh, you're in for a real treat. Please remember any time to put your comments in the chat or the Q&A and any comments, uh, we will save them and we will share them as well. There's today's sponsor of this program, Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle, and a program that we'll be doing with them on March 16th. I'll put something in the chat about that in just a moment. Hi and welcome everybody. So glad you're joining us this evening. One of the things that makes a film festival like ours, the Seattle Jewish Film Festival in its 26th year so special is having a chance not only to have filmmakers join us from all over the country, all over the world. Last night, we had a filmmaker from Tel Aviv joining us for the conversation about a different documentary film. But in particular, I'm extremely excited to introduce in a moment, our conversation today with an independent filmmaker. And I believe uh, Becky can tell us, but we were one of the first film festivals to actually uh, program her film. And I'm, I just love um, making relationships with independent filmmakers and hearing their journeys. And this is a really special film, I think, for our community and um, those of us that work in the community and are trying to build community, talk about Jewish values and what does it mean in a complex world, and especially given the, the sort of ripple effects of the challenges that we've faced in the last four years and COVID. I think this is all about trying to bring us together, understand each other through our differences. And I think that the message in this film really hits at home with that. So I just wanted to say a few things. I'm Pamela Lavid. If, if you didn't know that, um, I'm the director of the Seattle Jewish Film Festival, uh, have been for 17 years. I also run Arts and Ideas. And as of today, uh, we might have a 50% capacity in our auditorium coming up. So I think we might be announcing potentially a physical screening, which is very exciting for April. Um, I just wanted to make mention that we're in the middle of the Seattle Jewish Film Festival. There are 19 streaming films, so we can all be virtually together again and feel that sense, whatever way we can, of community and conversation. We focused on light, levity, love, laughter, and learning during this year's festival. And tonight you're in for a real treat to talk about this film. I think this is where the magic happens and what makes it very different than Netflix is to have filmmaker conversations and real conversations. So though you are all in the dark, like you'd be in a dark theater, we welcome you chatting. We welcome you putting things in the Q&A. We love comments. Don't hold back Seattle. Uh, we want you to put yourselves out there, please. This is, this is how we can create some connection and intimacy. So first of all, I just wanted to say we have another week of the film festival. As you saw, Breaking Bread uh, is the film that is screening. They ain't 
uh, ready for us. There's another uh, number of documentaries that are being dropped tomorrow. So please go to seattlejff.org and I'll put that in the chat in case you're joining us from somewhere else. Some of our films can be screened across the country, including this film tonight was available throughout the US. And the film tomorrow, They Ain't Ready, is also available through the US and a really important new documentary. And our next Zoom conversation will be on Sunday with director Brad Rothschild. So without further ado, I just wanna first thank uh, very much importantly, some of the lead sponsors uh, for the festival, the Loeb Family Foundation and Anonymous, which is always really fun to announce Anonymous <laughs> for uh, a recognition. But I also wanna thank uh, the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle, which is the lead sponsor for this film. And I'd like to bring uh, one of my partners in crime from Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle, one of my colleagues, Rachel Roseman, to join us for just a few moments. She is the legacy developer Development Manager, and I'm so pleased that you're here just to say a few words before we begin the screening and why maybe you decided to sponsor this film or what your work is currently. Thank you so much, Pamela. Um, so as Pamela mentioned, my name is Rachel Rosenman. I'm the Legacy Development Manager at the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle. And the Federation is a proud sponsor of the Seattle Jewish Film Festival, and we're particularly excited about this relevant film. For those of you who've already seen American Birthright, the questions it asks and explores are as relatable and alive in our own community today as they have been for a very long time. The Federation's community-wide study in 2014 identified 56% of married couples as being intermarried. And with the population explosion since then, we can reasonably assume that this number has grown too. So understanding and honoring our histories and our legacies as we simultaneously navigate our own individual truths and Jewish journeys is indicative of the Federation story as well. We're delighted to acknowledge and thank the many members of the Jewish Federation's Legacy Society who are here with us tonight. Thank you for remembering us with a gift in your will, your trust, your retirement account, your life insurance policy. You and so many others are making a huge difference. Thank you. And we're proud to bring engaging programs like Reset and Refresh and Honeymoon Israel to our community, which allow couples, many of whom identify as interfaith or mixed heritage, to have a cohort-based experience learning together, questioning together, and building connection and community with each other through a Jewish lens. So for myself, as the daughter of an Israeli mother and a New York native father, I grew up firmly understanding my parents' own perspective and feelings about intermarriage. They clearly conveyed that marrying another Jewish person would make my life both easier and smoother. And recently, I married my non-Jewish partner. I'm inspired by American Birthright in part because it reminds me that at the heart of my own Judaism is the imperative to live authentically, meaningfully, and consciously and that there are a multiplicity of ways that we can engage in Jewish life, express our values, celebrate with each other, and ensure the continuity of the Jewish people. So thank you for your continued engagement and support to help realize your Federation's vision for a vibrant, thriving Jewish community today and tomorrow. Enjoy tonight's program. Thanks so much, Rachel. That was such a thoughtful and engaging introduction. I really appreciate your partnership and that was very thoughtful of you. Thank you. Um, now, without further ado, and maybe I'm just gonna keep the reveal of uh, Becky for just one more moment. I have a little video to share that might be a way for us to at least understand the beginning of her journey. And rather than introduce it, Becky, if you're okay with it, I'm just gonna start with this. But before I do, I'm just gonna give, uh, tell you all a little bit about Becky Tahel. She was born in Haifa, Israel and raised in Philadelphia. She graduated from Temple University with a degree in communications and theater. She lives in Los Angeles where she runs Go Tahel uh, Productions. American Birthright is her flagship film. So I'm very excited. And before we see her, we're gonna go ahead and see her on screen. And I think you'll all really enjoy this. So give me a moment as I queue up uh, a little bit of a video for all of you and uh, we will begin in just a moment. So let me get this queued up and I did have it ready for you. <laughs> all right, okay, let's make my screen bigger and here we go. Enjoy everyone and then we'll see you in just a moment. Oh, <laughs> 
My bubby, she used to put seltzer in the matzo balls. Genius. Yeah? Oh, well, that's your bubby. This is my bubby's recipe. Look, I'm just trying to say that they look like sinkers. Says the guy who burnt the kugel. It took five generations of Cohen's to perfect this recipe. If you're digging on the matzo no, no, balls, no, no. you're digging on my grandma. Here, try one. Yep, sinker. Should we put seltzer in these, then? Yeah, we should put seltzer in them. That's why no! Who sets people up like that? This is a relationship. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to bring on Becky Tahel. It's a great way to introduce her. But Becky, why don't you tell us a little bit about your J date? It's, yeah. I, feel, I feel like it's Drew Barrymore, your poltergeist moment, right? Where we're showing you as as a teenager. Tell us a little bit about your your J date history and making J date commercials. That is so hysterical. First of all, it is such a pleasure to be a part of the lineup. It is. In honor, I'm so overwhelmed the last few uh, days and just getting all the feedback from people watching the film. So thank you for this opportunity. It really it, um, makes me emotional and I'm just so grateful to you. Uh, mm. Now on a lighter note, the JD commercial, not how I met my current husband, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the film, I am now married. Um, but it was something that I remember seeing a breakdown for. And as soon as I saw that, I said, this role is for me. And I, I remember walking into that audition, booking it, thinking I had made it. I am finally the constitution of a good Jewish daughter. And it really sparked a lot of the beginnings of this project because I'm the poster child for this, you know, for, for dating Jewish, um, as J-Date is. And my sister at exactly the same time when this uh, commercial aired, got engaged to a non-Jew. So it felt like all of these really interesting clashes and was a catalyst for, I guess, the movie of my life that I was writing. Um, I was writing it completely incorrectly because as you see in the movie, it takes a whole turn and I didn't quite know what I was uh, signing up for. But yeah, the J-Date commercial really did spark it all. And for me was um, a moment where I really grappled with who am I as a, as a brand, I guess, as a performer, but also as a person. Like, am I a Jewish person? Uh, actress? Am I, is that who I am? Is that my, my archetype, my type? So that was a really, um, so beginnings of a lot of those existential questions for me as an artist, as a person, and as a creative. I have a feeling that you probably conduct yourself in an existential kind of narrative way, but I'm, I'm maybe to start with the film, I was really struck at the beginning uh, by obviously Lech Lecha, right? That mm -hmm. is the quote that you use at the beginning, which is go for you, which can be translated in a lot of different ways. So how is it that you interpreted that as part of the beginning of the journey? Such a beautiful question. Um, a few years ago, I went to Sedona with my mom and um, she bought me this necklace and it was the man in a maze. There's like a man on top of this labyrinth that sort of goes to the heart of nothing, the heart of everything, the heart of himself, herself. And I really resonated with that. And I think with Lech Lecha, to me, like, yes, it's go and, and, and leave behind where you came from, your, your father's house and what you know, and, and almost reclaim that for yourself. And that's hard to do. I think for all of us, we spend years, um, if not an entire lifetime, often with friends or counselors or therapists or coaches, undoing a lot of, our, of the doings. And I think this film for me um, documented a lot of my undoing the doings and redoing a lot of things that I had to choose for myself. Uh, you know, as a Jewish people, there's a, there's a narrative and there's a lineage and there's all of this stuff that we carry and it can feel like a burden. And I, and my nature is to be light. My name Tahel means to bring light. And I needed to reclaim that levity in the tradition that I so loved, but felt like I didn't really connect to in my own way. And that was a lot of what Lech Lecha was for me is to leave behind what was put on me in a way, but at the same time, go to myself, really go mm -hmm. back to myself and reclaim who I am. There's a moment in the film, and I and I really only picked it up after watching it the second time and having a really wonderful conversation with you, um, which is, I think it's been Zayan Klatsko who says to you, I'm much more excited about your mm -hmm. journey than I am about your film or your, you know, or, or the movie. And it seemed to me that that was a tipping point where you, and again, go for you, you were originally going for your sister, right? You were going yeah. for a, a conversation about, intermarriage and it was not to, meant to be the camera on you. 
something changed. When did that happen? What was that journey and how did you decide to change the focus? I, in my nature, I'm a, and I told you this, Pam, I'm a people pleaser. I didn't want to be um, at the forefront of this hot button topic and to have to make some decision at the end. And God forbid that people might hate me for it or think that I'm judging them. So I was going to stay as far away as humanly possible from being in front of the camera. And I really wanted to ask all the experts and rabbis and everybody else but myself about this and, and just kind of pin them one against the other and make something really cool that way. And about two and a half years in, as I pinning rabbis and, and talking to people and interviewing and reaching out to people and trying to carve this movie out, um, it wasn't it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, you know, typically in in a in a movie, there's three acts, and the the first act is like setting up, and something happens to the protagonist where they enter the second act, and there's like the fun and games. There's a twist, something cool goes on that wasn't happening. Like nothing was happening for two and a half years of making this piece. And I thought it might end at my sister's wedding. But again, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, it she gets married and the movie still didn't end. It still wasn't pivoting. Um, and I couldn't figure it out, but I still really felt so, um, like, like I had this mission I was on and, and I had to finish the movie, but I couldn't figure out what it was about anymore. And that's when I sat down with Rabbi Klatsko. He was referred to me. I also realized I was hesitating to sit down with like a, an Orthodox rabbi um, that felt really heavy. And I felt like I'd be converted, even though I was already Jewish. I don't know, I was, I was afraid to be made you know, more Jewish. And I wasn't really into all of that. That wasn't where I was going with this thing. Um, and as a somewhat conscious person, I know that when I hesitate to do something, when I resist something, that's usually the very thing I need to do. And I'm so glad I did that. I'm so glad I pushed myself out of my comfort zone, sat down with Rabbi Klatsko. He looked at me and said, there's something deeper in this movie and it's about you. And I was like, no, it's not. I can't, I'm not an expert. Like it should be about the rabbis, the, right? I mean, it's a Jewish piece. And he said, absolutely not. <laughs> you mm. know, the, the power of a movie is that we see ourselves in the protagonist. No one's going to see themselves in a rabbi. They mm -hmm. will see themselves in you. And that was tough. I felt really selfish. I felt a little egotistical. Oh, this is a movie all about me and my life. Um, and that's just me, you know, bearing that that insecurity. And I'm, I'm really glad I took that turn and made it more yeah. about me. I have so many questions about that just to break it open. I mean, on the one hand, want to understand a little bit about your going from screen to behind the screen. Mm -hmm. And then you wound up in front of the screen, obviously. But what, what made you feel confident as a filmmaker to get behind the camera? Uh, what what was your background in that work? I know you have a production company. And then I, I have a more existential conversation, which is obviously as a people pleaser, when you ask everyone, you get very conflicting answers. And you went to just a slew of people. I think I wrote down there are, you know, therapists, there are rabbis, there are activists, sociologists, ambassadors, you know, Shabbat.com, historians, mystical teachers. And some of them have very conflicting advice. Yeah. So maybe if you could at least talk about what gave you the sort of skill set or at least the chutzpah to try to make this film. And then how did you navigate while you're having your own journey, all this conflicting information? It's, you know, it's chutzpah is really everything and a little bit of naivete. Like, I don't think I really knew what I was getting myself into. I was in my mid to late twenties. I um, felt like my career as a, as an actress really plateaued at the JD commercial. I wanted to make a calling card that people could say, Oh, she made that movie. We can hire her more. So it really started with like, I should make something. And I have a friend who has a camera, my friend, Aaron, um, who, you know, just was like, yeah, let's make a movie. So it really started out with a very simple, very naive um, intention but really that desire is what guided the entire thing because I still, you know, th that was the beginning, but I still felt like, and I talk about this Elizabeth Gilbert moment I had, and, and she talks about this big magic moment where like, you know, ideas live in a potential state and they look for host bodies. And I felt like though my intention was like kind of naive and a little self-serving, I wanted to make a calling card. I wanted to make a movie that would get me recognized, then found this Jewish entity of sorts and was like, oh yeah, oh, that's what you're going to do? How about you do it on interfaith marriage? And in came this idea, and I, I get chills, you know, still thinking about that moment um, because I had a conversation with that very thought, like, no, 
wait, maybe, you know, and then I called a mentor and another mentor. And suddenly I had a, a beat sheet of what this might look like. And I decided I, I would shoot a trailer and I would shop it around to my exec friends to like, make sure that I was making a, a calculated move. Cause I, I know movies are, you know, quite an endeavor and people kept saying, go for it. This is really cool. This, this kind of movie doesn't exist. You should definitely do it. So, um, it's, you know, I, I got a lot of support along the way. It started out, like I said, naively, but but I had always been creating content. I was doing a lot of writing, a lot of production. I worked for various uh, big time influencers on social media. So that also gave me a little bit more of that confidence boost. I was, I was assisting Eric Andre as well, who's in the film. And he was always very supportive of me and said, you, sh you know, you should really be writing more. I was a nanny for um, the Vanderbeeks who really should be, a, a, I should be thanking them a lot as well. I remember James Vanderbeek, who was Dawson on Dawson's Creek, um, was like, your, your stuff is great. Like you should be really creating for yourself. And that was what his comeback was, was about. And uh, Don't Trust the Bee in Apartment 23, he played himself. And he said, you should be making more of, of your own content. So I had like amazing, amazing mentors that just said, do it. And I did, and I fumbled, and it's not perfect. Um, and uh, and a lot of the again to that existential crisis and uh, the existential question that you had, that was the hardest part of this film. How how do I make sense of all of this? Like I got myself into uh, th this path of asking a question that's already really tough, but I made a commitment, and I don't back down on my commitments. So I, I knew I had to answer the question, but it was really difficult. And also going back to the fact that I'm a people pleaser and I didn't want to make my own decision. I didn't, and let alone if I were to arrive at one, I still wouldn't want to publicly put that in a movie, right? Like that's not really cool um, to me. That's what I thought. So it was really difficult. I wanted somebody to tell me my answer and they all kept telling me, you're not going to find an easy answer. And that was really frustrating. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, there are moments, I mean, for example, and that you had analogies as you're talking about your sister she's your you know your little sister and some of the conversations went to it's like jumping into a road with cars mm -hmm. i mean there are certain phrases that um uh you know you're jewish and you have to be separate um then there are i mean i loved your my two jew list which is <laughs> something i definitely want to make a t-shirt out of yeah um <laughs> and there's the oil and water. And so let's talk a little bit about some of the harder comments yeah. that you had to navigate around the intermarriage dialogue. And, you know, it, it's, it was not, I mean, there were other rabbis that actually had, you know, some beautiful things to say, which is there's a difference between beliefs versus religion. There's the soul, the soul thing, right? The kindred spirit, that notion of kindredness. Um, that really is ultimately um, what you're looking for in your match. And I was just wondering what that was like to sit and hear some comments, and yet it's about your sister, and yet it was also about you. How did you, how did you navigate some of those conflicting conversations? Oh, there was so much dissonance for me a lot of the time because, you know, as a creator, I'm chasing conflict because I know that's what makes a good movie, right? So in one, in one mm. sense, I'm wearing like the producer writer hat. And when I hear that bite, I'm like, oh yeah, ooh, juicy bite. This is great. And at the same time, my, my heart is hurting because um, my sister is in the other room, definitely is hearing this and, and is going to see it on camera. How do, how do I um, reconcile being like a good sister and a caring sister and a caring person um, with making a movie that leads the audience to want to wanna continue to watch that is truthful? Like that was, a, that was a bite that I heard and that really impacted me because it was a fear I had. Is my sister making a huge mistake and am I being put in this position to stop her, to help her, mm -hmm. to um, elucidate something for her. Like I didn't even understand my own role throughout mm -hmm. a lot of it. And I think still I'm, I'm uncovering exactly why this movie chose me. Um, and, and so, yeah, it was really difficult. And I was defensive in a sense. And in some ways I, it was um, validating. Like when someone said, oh yeah, that's dangerous. I would think, aha, so I'm right to feel wrong about this. What do I do now? And, and I, I, it felt, um, it was tricky. It was just really tricky producing the movie of my life and having things happen in my real life that were like writing themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And so I really had to make sure that I had my head on straight and it was, and that's where a good team is really helpful. I really couldn't have done it without my, my you know, production partner and, and my entire team, but it was rough. 
So I think, um, you know, there are moments where in the, in that we've talked about this a little bit where you're the big, the big idea is this question of the little T or the big T. Yeah. So truth and, and the realization, um, that you were searching for something that was subjective, lowercase t, versus this notion of either Torah as the big uppercase T, right? Or whether or not you needed you needed in order to follow someone else's journey, and and your sister was came at it from such an authentic place with her now husband. So what is that little T versus big T, and what's the journey of that for you? And there's this other parallel world that's going on in the film, right? We can see your clothing change, right? We there are things that are not addressed exactly, right? Of of your journey through seminary. So where does the T start at the beginning of the film? Where does it end and where are you now? I'm so glad you brought this up and it's really not a answer that I have fully fleshed out. Um, it's something I'm still walking with. It's a question that I'm, I'm trying to answer. And so I, I like invite this to be a, a collaborative experience. It's something that I'm, I think is really important to answer. Truth, we're in like a very post-truth era. It's being written about. It's like if you have a very emphatic opinion and you say it loud enough, it equals truth. And I think that's really dangerous and, and not true. Um, that I know to be true with a capital T, that we have to have an actual truth and be very conscious and careful around it. Now, what is truth? And I think when I started out the film, I was searching for personal truth, which I came to realize was a lowercase t. There's no, it's not a right or wrong. I'm not valuing either at this moment. It was just like, I wanted to find my truth. Mm -hmm. And you hear that, um, you hear that up until the turn in the movie and really through much of the entire film is I'm saying, I want to find my truth. I want to find my, my what Torah means to me, what my Judaism, Judaism means to me. And I think that is extremely valid and very important. But I think what needs to come first is a capital T and capital T truth means that there, there may be a not very sexy, not very fun, actual truth that we're all held accountable to. Um, and, and that was rough. That was when um, Rabbi Klatsko said, if Torah is truth, if at some time, thousands of years ago, God or the creator or something came down from the sky and, and, down, and we, the Jewish people downloaded a truth, then you got to figure out if you believe that. And if you do, you got to figure out what that truth means. And that was an intense moment because if, if there is truth and it's with a capital T, and again, I'm going to quote the movie. It's like, it's not whether I think it is. It's not whether my lowercase T truth is resonant. I got to follow that T. So I don't think it's one or the other. I absolutely believe that, that in, and currently where I am holding is there is a, a, a uppercase T. There is a truth which is why I started to make shifts in my life. I realized that I, when I was aligning with truth, that things in my life happened. When, when I was not aligning with truth, when I, and we know we do this from very minuscule things in the morning. When you wake up and you listen to that voice that goes, ah, snooze, whatever, you don't need to do anything. You have, there's nothing to do. You have no purpose. Whatever that like non-truth voice is, things don't move. There's no flow. But when you listen to that, true, true, deep voice. And it's not always very fun and it's not always very appealing and it's certainly not easy. But when you listen to it, things flow. I started to plug into truth and it wasn't always aligned with lowercase t me because there were difficult things. There was dressing differently and my day of the week where I could hang out with friends and drive and do things, I now became a day where I didn't do those things. And there was a lot of holding back and restricting and doing things differently and stopping and changing. And that um, is often, I think, the scariest part of one, a religious or spiritual path, because those changes to people on the outside look like, uh, oh, well, who are you? What is this? And there was certainly that to, to grapple with both internally and in interpersonally with my family and my friends, like things were changing. I am no longer working once the sun goes down on Friday until the sun goes down on Saturday. And that can be weird. I cover my hair. Like, when did you start doing that? What is that about? Um, I'm lucky to live in an environment that's pretty open and is really intrigued by it and finds it stylish and cool. You know, I think nowadays we're into unplugging and we're into cool, you know, hair wraps and things like that. But it 
it was more than that for me. So I, I think it, I would be doing this film a disservice and doing the audience a disservice without saying that we need to first grapple with if there is a truth and and follow truth and really push for truth, especially in a time in our in the world when just it's like anything goes. I don't think that's real. I don't think that is the capital T truth. I think one does exist. And I think we all have to go and run after it and then align it and integrate it with our lower T truth. I hope that made some sense. <laughs> it does. Um, I'm curious to know that, you know, you, you could have made a choice to interview a lot of couples like your sister who yeah. are on the verge of, uh, or had loving relationships and partners and taken a tour and use them as your experts. You actually went to a group of very different experts. And how did you make the decision about that tour of experts and who fell off the table or did you not get to interview or did you not want to interview? How did you make your choices about the voices that were going to influence your, your thinking? I was very tricky early on. I, I thought if I make this too Jewish, it's not going to really relate to a broad audience. And again, that conflicts with my very intention of making something that would get me noticed, right. Or get my work out there. If only my Jewish family and friends saw it, like that wasn't really meeting my goal. So I thought I'd open it up to everyone. And initially I did actually sit with a lot of my other millennial friends of different backgrounds and interview them. And, and my Armenian friends told me the same thing. My Hindu friends told me, oh God, yeah, we also are like, do we marry the same kind? And like, we, we probably should, but I found that like all of my friends really, really resonated with that. Um, and then I got the note of, this is too broad. Why are you, why can't you just lean into the Jewish narrative? Um, someone had said to me, you know, people don't tell the Wayans brothers to make their stuff less black. You shouldn't make your stuff any less Jewish. And I was like, that's really an interesting um, comparison. Okay, I guess niche does work. And it's funny, I think about the, the matchmaker in the, in the documentary where she goes, when you go like this, it's far easier to get what you want. You just have to be very specific. And that was tough for me. I, I'd rather appeal to everyone, but when you try to appeal to everyone, you run the risk of really not appealing to anyone because it's not specific. So that was a tough choice. And when I decided to make it specific, then a lot of things fell away. I gave myself permission to lean into interviewing the people that felt right unapologetically. I mean, there's a lot of Orthodox rabbis once we turn into Israel. Where are the Reform and Conservative? I grew up conservative. I have many friends in all streams of Judaism. Why am I not shedding light on that? And I still get that note. And I think it's a really, really valid note. Um, if I had a five hour documentary, we could bring in so many other, you know, avenues and, and um, streams of Judaism and discuss the differences and why. And we tinkered with having that. And then I realized it's actually not necessary to the journey. My journey from being honest led me in a more traditional route. I, me, just me. And that's the, it, it, like, I'm sure if, if somebody else goes on this journey, they will go somewhere different. And that's awesome. To me, I wanted to know what my great grandparents and my grandparents followed because they all were traditional Orthodox Jews. So I was like, let me just learn that. Because if I learn that and I know how we were, then I can find my shade of Judaism and my shade of Jew, right? Like my letter in the Torah, I can find that letter and who I am after. But if, but if I if I learn the stuff that came after, like reform and reconstructionist and all that, I'm missing, you know, the, the foundational stuff. So that's why I went in the orthodox path. And I'm glad I did. It really resonated with me. So I'm going to go ahead and ask, um, I would love for people to help me out by throwing in a lot of questions. And whether you've seen the film or not, this might be a subject that's close to you or something that Becky said has sparked something. But um, I, I wanted to um, mention that Julie asked a question. Uh, she, Julie Cole says, how has your mother and sister reacted to embracing your Jewish observance? And I would actually also add, how have they responded to the film? It's, it's awesome. It's a great question. So my mom early on, and I'll just have to give you a quick background about my mom. I know I say this in the film where she was the black sheep and she was raised by Orthodox Moroccan um, um, parents. So my, my mom's a Jewish educator and she's incredible. She's incredible. She's an incredible Hebrew teacher and incredible teacher and really colorful. And so to me, she, I was raised to sort of 
find it, believe that like orthodoxy was a little less colorful, you know, you kind of have to do things this way. And that's, it, it wasn't her flavor and it, you know, wasn't her letter in the Torah. And that wasn't something that was, that was on the table for us. So when I chose this path, and she started to see it happen. I was really intrigued by Shabbat. I was intrigued by kosher. I was intrigued by a lot of these things and I was telling her about it. Um, I could sense a little bit of her own hesitation. There's this thing in Judaism about like a tikkun, a correction that we make, uh, that our soul makes. And I, I told her, I was like, I feel like maybe I'm correcting something in all, like you left and I'm coming back. And maybe it's this cool thing that we all get to figure out how to do now and balance as a family. And sh she heard that and felt it and honored it and didn't feel like I was putting anything on her. Um, there's a, a rabbi who we only see for a snippet, Rabbi Brad Hirschfield, but he wrote a book, You Don't Have to Be Wrong for Me to Be Right. And that title literally says it all. Like she, if she doesn't choose my path, she that doesn't mean that she's wrong and must be wrong for me to feel right in the decision I made. So we absolutely as a family continue to hold a lot of space for each other despite, you know, my mom can't call and, you know, on Shabbat and there's things that I just were not able to do. Um, I can't eat from her dishes. And that's really weird for my mom, who is the Moroccan chef and feeds me all the time. But, you know, we find ways. We brought a pot and a pan for her last time. She was like, oh, this isn't so bad. The flexibility and the openness was really nice. And my sister has always been that. I mean, that's like without question. My sister um, is, is a fantastic soul. She's a, a psychiatrist. So obviously is able to see and hold space for a lot of things. Um, but sh she was always very patient with me and also very curious. My sister continues to call me and ask me Jewish questions. And so does her husband. And mm -hmm. I think that is really the most inspiring and um, beautiful. You're the sillest that she comes, she comes to ask yeah. you about it. <laughs> it's so, so I cool. that. and I, I mean, who am I? Like I said, I'm like an expert at being a non-expert, but at least I can tell her what I know and how mm -hmm. I relate to those things. And that's really, really gratifying. Well, there's something very powerful about reclamation and, um, and you called it to, obviously in my family, I didn't learn a lot about being Jewish and I'm now a Yiddish speaker. And so there are things that one has to reclaim in order to relearn. And it's a little bit like skipping generations. There's a sense that um, there's the, the pendulum that goes back and forth. There's a number of questions that I would love to, to pose for you, but there are a number of people would like to know how you met your husband, yeah. who is at the end of the film, obviously, is a year later and you jumped that year for us. But can you tell us a little bit about that journey for you and how the sort of, he's Orthodox, I think he's also Moroccan. Uh, so, and in Seattle, often we call, unfortunately the Ashkenazic Sephardic has become a, a intermarriage is what we call it in yeah. the Pacific Northwest, which is a strange phrase that has taken place for a hundred years, people have said that. So tell us a little bit about your journey meeting him. Absolutely, um, when I came back from Israel, and dove into post-production. That was a lot of that time after um, I sat there with Aaron, my, my uh, production partner, and we you know, tried to wrap our, our brains around the over 100 hours of footage and how we we're going to make a movie out of it. Um, and I, again, at that point too, I said, I should probably start dating. I was dating myself, like the matchmaker told me. I, I wanted to really get clear on who I was and what I really wanted. That's something I never did. I didn't have like a, this is important. These are my values. This is what I want. Just, it wasn't, I didn't clarify it like that. So when I came back, because I was doing that and making this film, I was really, really clear. As soon as I put that out there, I, I, met, I met Nathan at a party. It was literally, I was invited to be a part of it. I was a, a Moisha House Without Walls host. So I used to get these micro grants to do events and it was a local Jewish event. And uh, a friend of mine had asked if I'd come in and maybe sponsor a, a bit of it. It was a silent disco. So we got these really cool headphones and um, awesome DJs. And it was at a, a really nice you know, house here in the hills. Um, and I met him and instantly there was a kindred spiritness. Again, it was, it was this knowing, um, we met him passing. And then that following week, a friend came by to pick me up on a walk to a Shabbat meal and he was there. And that friend mentioned, oh, he's, he's Moroccan and also Israeli, actually. He was born in Israel, but like raised mostly here. And I felt like I saw a version of myself, but not the version that existed before the movie because he was observant and kept kosher and was like very specific about things. And I don't think the previous Becky would have really liked that. It was, um, he had very clear 
parameters for his life, which I think, again, for the previous me was not very cool, was not very sexy, was not what I wanted. Um, but the new me was like, oh my God, this is exactly what I want. Somebody who's clear because I was finally clear. And I think that's, I mean, it's not the age old thing where you 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 essentially merit and, and draw to you who you are and the, from the level that you are and from where you are in your life. And that clarity that the movie forced me to, to arrive at really is what drew him in. And it was very mm. early on that we had the conversation about it. And I like rolled down my Megillah of like the to-do list, but it was like the to marry list. So this is what I like all the things. And I, again, unapologetic, so not who I was before the movie. And he was like, oh, that's great. You can check that and check that. And he was pleased with the fact that I knew what I wanted. So this thing totally worked. Amazing. Um, so I just have a comment here. So mm -hmm. Hava writes, uh, hi, Becky, thank you so much for this film. As someone who grew up in an interfaith home and became religious in my early 20s, I identified with so many pieces of what you explored. And as a younger sister with older sisters, I found myself identifying very strongly with Gal, uh, even though my older sisters were the ones who married non-Jewish men and I became religious. I was so surprised to see that you didn't explore more of the seminaries available to women uh, who are growing religious. And obviously there's on the Upper West Side, there's lots of them in the US as well. How did you choose Neve and Pardes uh, to facilitate your journey? Uh, did you spend any time off camera at uh, Sheyarim and Midrashet, uh, Rachel Vachaya, Maya Nod, Bad Ayan, et cetera? Awesome. We've got a whole yeah. a slew of them. Thank you and Kol Tov. It's a great question. And, you know, to me, again, it was luck and falling into the opportunity and it feeling right, right away. And my just saying, let's go with it. Let's go with this. So when I had the idea um, after speaking with Rabbi Klatsko to focus on myself and turn the cameras on me, he suggested that I go and study. And again, that resistance of like, mm, I don't know, can I like one, I don't want to give up the job and the apartment and like the cushy lifestyle in Beverly Hills. Um, it wasn't that fancy, but it was comfortable. It's what I knew. Um, it, but, but I felt like, okay, they're saying this and they're also saying that they're going to fund it, which is nice. That's always really attractive. Thank you to all of those things. Honeymoon Israel birthright. Like there's a beauty when someone says, and we'll pay for your ticket. Um, so I said, you know what, why not? And, and it, it wasn't an immediate thing, but my sponsor, um, Mr. Horowitz, Mr. Horowitz, uh, Richard Horowitz, um, you know, suggested Neve. And he said, by the way, if you don't like Neve, you pop around, but something about it, I don't know. And it's, it's not for everyone. And the question comes from a place of also knowing that it's not for everyone. There's um, various other flavors of seminary. But I think to me, I really, I really wanted that like, that black and white, the strong opinions. Um, and it didn't, and it wasn't when I say that black and white strong opinions, my rabbi, Rabbi Edelstein is the Dean at Neve, still the person I go to. He's so spirited and spiritual and deep, and it doesn't feel like it's this or that and take it. That's never the experience I had there. There was a lot of strength in their understanding. And there's a lot of um, uh, just a, a, a real like, strength is the only word that comes to mind in like really sharing the Torah that they had. And it just immediately resonated with me and the girls there were awesome. Um, no. So there's a comment from uh, Judy Newman. There are many programs to continue on this uh, to engage and reconnect Jews in their twenties to Judaism. And obviously the title of your film resonates with a lot of uh, kids who obviously go on birthright. Um, while you took a different path, your personal journey seems extremely meaningful in finding your truth. How would you encourage your peers to go on a personal journey, journey or route and really delve in to find their truth and connection to Judaism, maybe Israel as well? Uh, where do they start? So I, I don't think anyone has to take like five months off or make a movie that takes six years to get to an answer uh, for any burning Jewish or non-Jewish question. Um, I just think it's about starting somewhere and having the desire to go. I, I didn't, it, that desire was lying dormant for me for such a long time to even figure out what Judaism was and what it meant to me. So the first most important thing, and this has since become this sort of workshop that I, I try to facilitate, it's called walking with questions. As soon as you ask a question, you're creating the vessel. Without a question, there is no space for an answer. And I think that is the first most important thing for anyone. It's, um, it's, 
honoring that there is a question and figuring out what it is and running after it. Because as soon as you ask the question, I, I guarantee that answers will start to come in, whether it's a local organization, whether it's, again, like I, I, I ask people to reach out to me, I'm happy to pair people up with other people. And that's something I'm also working on is being a resource for people who are interested in, in continued learning that works for them, that matches who they are, that, that fits their flavor of Judaism. Because um, Pamela, I think I told you this, that when I've had people watch the trailer and say, oh, I want to go to seminary. And I'm like, oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Not to say that seminary is like a terrifying, scary thing, but I think we also um, need to have our, our priorities and our head on straight and a real coherence about it. Because I've also seen people go to seminary and completely lose their real sense of self. They lost their lower, lowercase t in exchange for uppercase t, but they, those both need to be integrated. So I think it, there's a real urgency for everyone to ask the question and run after truth, but also do it in a way that is really resonant, that is patient, that honors who they are, where they feel like they are seen and are and their process is honored. And there are amazing, amazing, amazing resources for that. Um, many of them. Um, I'm working on building that out in the American Birthright website, where it's like, you know, maybe like a choose your own adventure, choose your own Jewish adventure of like this. I really like the Kabbalah. I really like the spiritual stuff. Where do I go for that? I really, really like the halacha. I like the black and white. Tell me what to do. Make it simple. You know, mm -hmm. let's start with that. So um, I think it's looking for local resources, finding the flavor that really works for you. Not everyone's your rabbi or Rebbitzin and that's okay. I, <laughs> that's I, a great I, title, by the way. Not everyone's your rabbi. You know what? That should be, that's the tab. <laughs> Not everyone's your rabbi and that's okay. Find your rabbi and don't give up. If that doesn't work, that's not my answer. Mm -hmm. That didn't resonate yet. There's a number of questions that are, you know, simple questions, I guess, to the extent of cinematically, what are you working on now is one of the questions. But also there's questions like, will there be an American birthright part two? I guess, you know, it sounds like American pie. Um, but, you know, yeah. do, do you feel given the journey that you wound up only telling half the story that there should be a second part? Where does this lead you to in, in your work and in your own journey as a filmmaker? You know, there was like a, an interesting dream I had where the part two is where I get to do this. And it's my documenting of sharing the experience with others and what the film produced in me. Um, you know, a part, a part of me hopes that, you know, the, the, the version of me before the movie was confused and, and kind of bumping into things and just sort of trying to figure it out. And I came out the other side, a lot more clear, a lot more grounded, married with a child um, who is about to turn five months old, like a, in a production company creating a lot of meaningful content. Um, I've grown, I've grown in confidence. I've grown in my abilities to direct and create things for other people. So a part of me wanted to document this cross country or really cross globe uh, screening tour and, and then COVID hit. So I guess the virtual thing we'll have to do for now but there is a real desire that I have to have every Jew watch this film and see this film and to have that conversation. Um, and that's not to say that I don't want every non-Jew to see it either. And that feels like different from my initial goal. I wanted everyone, I want this to be really broad and for it to relate to everyone, I do. But I think we're also born into a family, into a, a soul family that we, we are meant to do things for. And so I, to, to be able to inspire like my brothers and sisters, is really important to me. And I think that's a part of healing a lot of like repairing a lot of the tears that have happened, you know, leading up to now with our people. I think it's a crazy time. Anti-Semitism is on the rise and there's just so much that needs repairing. And I, I, I don't know the role I play. I'm open to the role I'm supposed to play. And there is potentially that as an avenue of, you know, J date confused girl finds her legs and then truth with a capital T and lowercase c they're integrated promise and then heads off across the country and then the world to inspire a real healing and that's the real tikkun olam right so that's like a big vision um in in the meantime i'm certainly producing um a lot of other content i'm working for several jewish organizations creating really meaningful content which i'm so excited about and also doing some mainstream, you know, music videos and, and short films that we're very excited about for other clients. And I'm open, I'm open to the next topic. I'm open to whatever that next big magic moment is supposed to be. Was there something that 
blew your mind that you heard in the journey? Was it just a mind blowing piece of information? And then what was the most difficult thing that you also heard? I'm curious to know what were the two things that really you had, you know, unsettled you mm. and also um, you struggled with and the thing that really was uh, just life-changing for you? So I think they're one in the same. I, I initially, when you said like the most mind-blowing and to me, like the exciting part about learning that, um, and I struggled with this in the movie where there's many ways to be Jewish that was also like a, oh, because I, well, I was told that like, if you're going to be a by the book Jew, where you learn the book and you do the things the book says, like, doesn't it just look, everyone wears a black hat and then like everyone's a black and white. And it turns out that that's not the reality. And that's not, that's just the Judaism that I thought I knew. So that was really cool to find out that there are many flavors and many pockets of different Jews. And that was cool. It was also very confusing at the same time. Like, oh no, another set of things that I need to choose between. Um, but then when I realized that it really is about like claiming and finding your letter in the Torah, that I love, that we're each a letter in the Torah. There are 70 faces to the Torah. There's a lot of ways that this is um, sort of given over in the tradition that, that yes, there is a guidebook. There's, it's, it's like a highway and there are many lanes and you pick your lane and you can switch lanes. And sometimes you stay in your lane for a while. And sometimes you, there's traffic ahead and you're not feeling resonant with where the lane is taking you. So, you know, and that was really cool. Um, so I'm all about sort of finding my letter in the Torah. And I think I found the letter that's really resonant for me. And um, is, am I going to be like this forever? Who knows? I hope to continue to grow. Um, and I'm open to that. And I think the part of my brand, so now I have to claim that I, yes, my brand is Jewish and I'm not running away from that. Um, but my brand is being curious and being open and continuing to ask the questions. I've ticked off some of the to-do list questions, but then there's new ones and there's deeper ones within those banners, modesty. Oh, I'm certainly walking with so many questions around modesty and so many questions around halacha and so many questions around kashrut. So that continues. Um, but something that was also really interesting and also very difficult was something that I was trying to get somebody to tell me, like interfaith marriage at a soul level, are there repercussions for, for interfaith marriage? And this takes going out on a bit of a limb. Um, but from what I heard from Rabbi Daniel Katz, who is like our mystical guy, he said, yeah, there are. There, there just are spiritual repercussions. Does that mean that if you marry a, a, a non-Jew that you're, we don't, we don't believe in being condemned. And it's just, there is a spiritual repercussion. And like, that was really hard for me to hear. That was really hard mm -hmm. for me because in one sense, it felt resonant. I felt like mm -hmm. I do kind of have this thing with other Jews where I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I feel you. I have that with non-Jews too though. But but when I heard that from my sister, I was it brought that worry back up. That mm -hmm. is her soul on some higher, deeper level, like not mm -hmm. at its ultimate ideal mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, um, and I love Amanda's comment in here. She says that this film could really help uh, work towards some better matchmaking services for all singles, uh, which is really wonderful. So maybe that's your next path. But Noted. I do think there's a, a moment in the film where you turn to the camera and it's the timing is beautiful. And you just say, I have a lot of questions. And I think that that openness, especially as we've just gone through the Mitzrayim of the last four years and COVID and the sense of we could all be very closed down at this time. Uh, I think you've given us a tremendous amount to think about when it comes to the openness of these conversations. And I think obviously for those of you that haven't seen the film, it's not a spoiler alert, but I do think it is about acceptance. It is about difference and being able to continue the conversation. And I love what you said that, uh, you know, when you have a question, there's space for an answer. So mm -hmm. thank you for your beautiful film. Is there anything that we missed, Becky, that you want to share with us? And otherwise, I just want to thank everyone who's joined us. And there's a, an entire week. Actually, we go through next Sunday for the Seattle Jewish Film Festival. I'm sad that this conversation is over. I've been so looking forward to this. Becky, you are a breath of fresh air, said Julie mm -hmm. Cole. Uh, mm -hmm. You've gotten a lot of compliments, uh, but I just want to thank our sponsors. Thank you, Jewish Federation. And is there any last words that you want to share with us? It's just something that you made me think of that no one ever changed because they were judged. And that was a, a line that we were going to end the film with and it just didn't fit. 
Um, but it's something I think is so important that if, you know, holding space for each other, despite our differences is really the most important thing. And it, it feels tough, but if we care for one another and we care for ourselves, we don't judge ourselves or the other. We never know where a person is and we never know why they are where they are. So I think to really hold space with love and yes, you might want someone to be somewhere they're not, or yes, you might think that they should be somewhere else. But again, no one ever changed because they were judged. So I hope we can continue to be with a lot more love and a lot of just bigger, more expansive space for one another. I think that is the way that as a Jewish people, as, as people, as humanity, and as a, a world right now that's needing that sort of space, that we really get to our, our next level collectively as humanity. And that's what I really, really wish for all of us. I think that's amazing. And by the way, there is a lot of love that's pouring in for you. It's love you, Becky. Mazel tov from Sherry Griffiths. Uh, Shani is, says, Nazika says you're amazing. Miriam Chankin says love you, love Becky. Miriam. I apologize if I'm butchering your friends' names or people's no, names. No, you're doing great. Aaron Davis, love you, Becky. Becky, Bethy, you are fresh of air. So obviously you've sparked something in all of us. And I think that's, you know, obviously that's what we're all meant to do is um, is we're somewhat broken vessels, but to spark in, in each other these mm -hmm. ideas and questions. So thank you for your beautiful mm -hmm. film. It was an honor to include you. And obviously, do you have upcoming screenings? Are these coming up at Idlewild or Miami or have these already happened? So Idlewild, they decided to not screen uh, virtually because they were afraid of, play, of of people ripping movies offline. So I know, so that one won't be, but- Any upcoming screenings you can tell people about? Yeah, we have Miami coming up in April. So the exact dates are being released March 22nd. So we will have the most up-to-date things on AmericanBirthrightFilm.com, screenings tab, Miami. And we do have a couple more. I can't announce them yet, but they will okay. also be going- um, under that tab. So yeah. And will these be national screenings like ours? So people yes. can tell friends across the country. Okay. Yes. Fabulous. I'm going to stop recording everyone. Thank you all for joining us. And Becky, what an honor to have you here. Thank you. And good luck Much with love. your beautiful five-month-old. Take Thank care, you. everyone. Stay safe, stay well, and come and see more films. <laughs> <laughs>